Uh, welcome to our special AZ Bio webinar on non-competition agreements and the FTC. So when the FTC came out with their new final rule on non-competes, it caused a lot of questions in the marketplace. And so we reached out to our friends at Spencer Fain and said, we need an expert that can help with this. And I want to do a shout out to Mike for um, introducing me to Helen Holden. And Helen works with businesses um, to help them understand how to successfully navigate the alphabet soup of federal and state employment laws and how they impact companies. And she's been doing it for over 20 years. And so today she's going to help us kind of understand the lay of the land, what's final and what may not be final, and um, kind of take it from there. So Helen, I'm going to disappear and it's all yours. So thank you, Joan. Much appreciated. Um, I uh, appreciate presenting to AZ Bio and I appreciate everybody's attention and uh, and participating this morning. So um, the uh, the intro that Joan provided says I've been doing this for over 20 years and it's a woeful underestimate. Longer than anyone cares to admit is that is my usual line. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the FTC action, what they did, kind of the timeline, understanding where that is, what the rule provides, and then I'm going to jump into state law because ultimately um, I think that's where we need to understand what the law is on a state level, first in the interim and then in the long run as well. So um, the Federal Trade Commission proposed a rule on non-competition agreements. Um, they, the, to understand this, the rulemaking process, you have to go back to January of 2023. Um, and they first at that time um, issued a an initial proposal um, to ban non-competes and they published that by the Federal Trade Commission. It took folks by surprise. Uh, the White House prior to that had issued some um, guidance stating that um, they were opposed to non-competes, that they found them on, on anti-competitive. And so the FTC took that up. Um, this is a little bit part of what some call uh, an all of government approach by the current administration and the, the, the past several administrations as well, to be fair, where multiple branches of the federal government are acting on similar items. So you can see this where both the NLRB and the Department of Labor, in my field, it's labor and employment law, so I'll give you examples from this, but it happens in other areas as well, such as environmental law. But you can see where like the NLRB and the Department of Labor will each issue rules on a subject, joint employment, or um, uh, independent contractors. And then they work together to try different approaches to see kind of what sticks a little bit. And this is what's going on in the non-compete arena with the FTC. The NLRB has also issued um, some indications of their position on, um, on non-compete agreements. There was a... Um, a case that the National Labor Relations Board brought in Ohio against a, um, a med spa. Um, and they took the position that the non-compete agreement in that instance was an unfair labor practice under the National Labor Relations Act. So um, again, an all of government approach, multi-pronged, they are uh, approaching these things with multiple different agencies. And this one is by the FTC. Um, and so in January, 2023, took us a little bit by surprise, partly because it was so sweeping. There were no carve outs. 
There were no executive agreements. They almost didn't say you could have a non-compete in conjunction with the sale of a business. Although if you read that carefully, um, there, you know, that was, that was a carve out. Uh, but it took us by surprise at that time. It took them over a year to kind of gather the, um, the input and then they voted to finalize a new rule in April of 2024. Again, splash, made headlines everywhere. What does it mean? The FTC is acting, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then May 7th, just last week, it was published in, uh, in the federal register. And that's just part of the federal rulemaking process. They vote to finalize the new rule. The timeline for the rule to go into effect does not occur until after it's published. And then the rule will go into effect. And you note my spoiler there, if not previously enjoined, September 4th of 2024, which is um, the requisite number of days, um, 120 days after the publication in the federal register. So I'm gonna to talk to you first about um, what what the rule bans and what it says. So what is banned by the new rule are new non-competition agreements. Non-competition agreements are defined as in any agreement prohibiting workers, and workers are defined very broadly. It includes employees, independent contractors, apprentices, interns, anyone that provides services to a business from seeking or accepting work with a different business. So um, very broad definition of a non-compete. Now your agreements aren't gonna say this. You, you aren't gonna have an agreement that says um, em employee A is, you know, Helen is prohibited, um, agrees not to work for any other company. It'll say working with a different company in the same or similar industry, doing the same thing. Um, and um, we can talk a little bit about how agreements are drafted when I get to the state law aspect of things. Uh, but it also is agreements entered into after the effective date. So remember back here, we talked briefly about that effective date, September 4th, 2024. So any agreements entered into after that date are void, um, cannot be enforced. Well, what about between now and then? So you can enter into an agreement but note that if the rule goes into effect, again, these are big ifs, but if the rule goes into effect and the breach of the agreement occurs after that time, it's not going to be able to be enforced unless it falls into um, one of the narrow exceptions. And I'll talk about what the exceptions are. Um, the, the rule also specifies that these are express and implied um, non-compete agreements. So if it's a confidentiality agreement that is so broad as to prohibit somebody from going to work for another company, then the fact that it's called a confidentiality agreement is not going to assist the employer in that instance from um, having the agreement be void under this. So narrow carve out, here um, for existing agreements with senior executives. Senior executives in this instance are defined as those who earn more than $151,164. And yes, that is a very precise number, but that's what the rule says, and have certain kinds of policy making authority. Now, what they're talking about are high level executives, um, CEOs, CFOs, chief compliance officer, chief anything officer that has true policy making authority. The FTC does, um, does specify that, um, that they believe this is going to be fewer than about 1% of employees. So not 1% of executives, but 1% of employees. 
Um, and they are going to look at this fairly, you know, they are going to scrutinize it. And again, those are existing agreements. So once the effective date goes live, September 4th, should that occur, then um, you can't have an agreement after that time. So to the extent you'd be concerned about this, you might want to consult with counsel, put those agreements in place with senior executives now, because those will remain effective after the after the um after the date. Um, and then agreements between buyers and sellers of businesses are, um, are carve outs from this. Um, I wonder if this goes into effect. It doesn't say it's definitely all or substantially all the assets of a business. But, um, you know, I've been asked maybe if you can provide a small amount of equity, a 1% interest, um, and tie the non-compete to that on the sale of a business. I think it's only at the time of sale, though. You can't do it in advance with an executive. So sometimes I see employers putting in place non-compete agreements or other kinds of employment protections. And it goes both ways because they'll give the executive um, some severance in exchange for a release in the event of a change of control. And in exchange for that, the executive provides a restrictive covenant, right? That's very common. Um, so unless the executive, unless that's entered into prior to this effective date, I don't believe that that would be valid after the effective date, should the rule go into effect. Um, and then also um, those agreements between buyers and sellers of businesses are still going to remain um, viable. So one other provision, um, in the rule specifies that employers have to notify workers that previously executed non-competes uh, are no longer enforceable and will not be enforced. Um, so this is the excerpt um, uh, from the rule that provides a form of notice for employers um, to, to, to give to employees. And it says, you know, talks about a new rule enforced by the FTC makes it unlawful to enforce the such an agreement. And, you know, we're not gonna enforce our non-compete clause. So you would technically be in violation of the rule if you didn't uh, send a similar notice out after the effective date, should the rule go into effect. I'm saying that a lot. So any business under the jurisdiction of the Federal Tr Trade Commission Act is going to um, have this applicable to them. And there are a narrow class of businesses, um, including banks and insurance companies, nonprofits, transportation companies, and air carriers. There are others that this doesn't apply to. Um, notably, it's nonprofits. So things like, you know, but they're going to look at what that really means as far as whether it's a not-for-profit business or whether it truly is a for-profit business. So um, we've had a number of questions about this and that's gonna be a case-by-case -case analysis. Um, so a little bit of a word on what is not banned. Um, one, confidentiality agreements, again, um, making sure they're not so broad as to effectively ban um, competition. And I've seen some that can be very, very broad. You can't use information in any way, shape, or form um, in subsequent employment. Um, and by the way, it's everything that you ever learned while you worked here and how to, how to do your job. So no, that would be um, unenforceable. Non-solicitation of customer agreements. Um, So again, can't be so broad as to effectively ban um, competition. Um, and then anti-piracy agreements, which are non-solicitation of employee agreements, those are permissible. A, a note about those though, that there's a special scrutiny for those because um, the antitrust laws disfavor those non-solicitation of employees 
provisions. And, and I've seen them where they become unenforceable, where you have them not between employer and employee, but where you have them between um, in a in a more vertical business situation. So have to be a little bit careful about those. And, and you know, I should caution because I'm a lawyer and I practice in this area, you know, you do want to work with counsel to put these agreements in, in effect, all of them, confidentiality agreements, non-solicitation of customer agreements, anti-piracy agreements, because there are some ins and outs and um, to them. And um, there's also, you know, a whole body of law that's trade secret law um, that comes into play here as well as well as implications in terms of your intellectual property and you know work for hire and all those things is a little beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about today and beyond the scope of what I personally do. Um, that would be my colleagues in our intellectual property um, field. And you know, a number of those folks um, have also expertise in this area that overlaps with the non-compete situation. And then again, agreements not to compete in relation to a sale of business are not included. So um, a note here on my crystal ball. Um, so what's gonna happen? What's going on with this? Um, well, I of course don't really have a crystal ball. Well, I might have one, but it doesn't really work. If I could predict the future, I would, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with this rule, primarily because there are a number of business groups that have already sued. Um, as is common with some of the federal regulations that the business community is concerned about, um, a suit was brought in the Eastern District of Texas, and that has become kind of the, the go-to place. And another one was brought in the Northern District of Texas. It's always happening in Texas. Northern District of Texas is Dallas, and the Eastern District of Texas is, um, again, one of these jurisdictions that um, has become known for uh, a lot of this litigation. They've got a patent rock and doc, rocket docket. So there's a lot of uh, patent litigation that occurs there as well. Um, and the business community contends that the rule is overbroad and that the FTC did not have authority to, uh, to promulgate this rule. Um, again, no crystal ball. So I don't know what's going to happen with this litigation. Um, but many experts that I have read and, and heard from uh, do not believe that this rule ultimately will be upheld. There is a pretty good chance that it's going to be enjoined um, by the one or both of those courts. Um, and then just a little bit of wonky lawyerism. Um, if it does get enjoined, um, there becomes a question of whether that's a nationwide injunction or whether it just enjoins um, the enforcement in that jurisdiction, again, either the Eastern District of Texas or the Northern District of Texas. There may be other litigation that's already, that's been filed as well. Those two came out like right away within a week of the filing of the rule. The NFIB and other business groups were very anxious to get this um, out there, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as well. So um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen with this litigation. But if an injunction does get issued, then it goes to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, almost certainly we're going to have uh, an appeal. And the Fifth Circuit, you know, they'll do what they do, and then it would go um, up to the Supreme Court from there. In the meantime, again, you don't always know what's going to happen in these instances, as we just saw with the Arizona Supreme Court and some of their uh, recent rulings. So you don't know exactly what's going to happen in, in the interim, uh, depending on what the courts do. But 
I would venture a guess that the injunction if issued would stay in effect during that time period. There's something called, and I'm not at all an expert on this, it goes to federal constitutional law and I practice labor and employment law, but we, there's obviously some overlap. Um, there is a doctrine called the major questions doctrine that the Supreme Court has ruled on in a number of instances. And um, many experts believe that the courts will use that doctrine to say that the FTC's action in this case was an overreach. Um, there's also a current case at the US Supreme Court involving um, court deference to agency action known as the Chevron Doctrine. Again, this is the wonky legal part of the presentation. I guess it's all a little wonky and legal in this area. Um, but the Chevron Doctrine um, has been challenged uh, by some litigants, and that's before the U.S. Supreme Court. They're supposed to issue uh, a decision on that um, sometime in the next six weeks. We expect to see that. So that might have an impact as well on whether this injunction would be issued and what happens subsequent to, um, to that time period. Again, while I don't have a crystal ball, um, many, many experts are suggesting very strongly that the Federal Trade Commission may well have overstepped its authority in promulgating this rule. Um, and also note that it was a, there's a the commission is is a five member commission and there was a three two vote so two commissioners voted against this rule. Um, I would also say in this area I'm going to talk a little bit about state law and and you know these things go up and down um, the law progresses in in various ways and so my suspicion is that these commissioners understand that this might be a stretch, but that's how new ground is broken. They stretch, they get cut back, but there's this little, there's this little sliver of light that they could come back and do something different the next time. And so then they try that and, and so forth. And that's how, that's how these kinds of proposals um, that are new and different and sweeping, um, end up so but that's a several year process um in the in the meantime we have the rule it's slated to go into effect in september and we're watching closely the litigation um and so what does that mean in the interim um what does that mean if the rule is enjoined um i'm gonna talk to you now about the state law um applicable to non-competes and um, I'll do a dive into Arizona law, but just generally speaking, non-competes have become um, a bit of a hot button topic. A few years ago, there was a Jimmy John's franchise, and I think it was in Washington, D.C., that had all of their delivery people sign non-competes. And this went viral um, and there was this big outcry within the food and beverage industry between workers groups that said, this is outrageous. They're delivering sandwiches, for goodness sakes. What's the interest that the employer has in prohibiting non-competition between Jimmy John's and Subway? Um, and so it's been a trend for a number of years. And non-competes have become unenforceable due to legislation in a number of jurisdictions. Famously, California. Um, and California's had a prohibition on non-competes for quite some time, in excess of 20 years. Um, Non-solicitation agreements are also uh, unenforceable in California. And in addition to that, the California legislature uh, passed some legislation last year that required employers to provide notice to employees who may have had those unenforceable non-competes and letting them know that that those were invalid and void as a matter of California law. And those notices had to go out in February of this year um, because there were a lot of employers. And, and they've also have rules in California where um, you can't choose another state law um, 
anything, a restrictive covenant related to employment has to be governed by California law and they're unenforceable. And, um, and it's not just unenforceable, but prohibited by law. Um, North Dakota also has a statute, Oklahoma, Washington, D.C., um, and Minnesota this last year entered uh, entered the fray and added a uh, added some legislation to the to the statute books in Minnesota. Um, they are severely limited in other jurisdictions: Colorado, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, New Hampshire, Oregon, Rhode Island, Virginia, and Washington. I want to say Massachusetts may also um, have a statute that limits non competes. Um, they do this in various ways. In, in Colorado, it's extremely limited. Um, Colorado has a requirement that in order for the non-compete to be valid, the employer must provide 14 days advance notice to the employee. Um, they have a provision like California does where you, um, you can't pick another state law to make it enforceable. Um, and um, they have, uh, monetary limits on what the employee who is entering into the non-compete makes. So similar in the state of Washington, where you need to, uh, employees who make under a certain amount of money, originally it was around $100,000 a year. Um, now it's gone up and there's an annual adjustment built into the statute. So it's 100 and whatever it is. Um, in the state of Washington, you can't enter into a non-compete with an employee. Um, some of these other statutes have similar uh, restrictions. I, I tell you this partly because I think it's important to understand the national landscape in which the FTC rule lands. These are one of these things that have increasingly become under scrutiny. And so um, I think it's important. And then increasingly, I don't know, um, where the folks on this uh, webinar do business, but increasingly our Arizona clients do business in a number of other states. Most uh, most uh, companies these days are likely to have a remote employee somewhere else. And so even if you're an Arizona em employer, note that if you've got a remote employee in Colorado, you've got to follow that Colorado rule because Colorado says you can't pick Arizona law as your jurisdiction for that agreement. So just note that if you've got, um, you know, if you've got employees who are remote employees in other jurisdictions, it is important to comply with the local law on the non-competes. I also would say um, that there've been some judicial cutbacks as well. I, uh, I'm not going to talk in, in great deal, uh, in, a, in a great deal of detail about it, um, but the state of Wyoming, the Supreme Court of Wyoming cut back. They changed their analysis of the way they will look at non-competes just within the last two years. So there's some increasing activity both in the courts as well as in legislatures and attention being paid to non-competition agreements. Now, again, most of this activity relates to non-competes not non-solicitation agreements, not anti-piracy agreements, and not confidentiality agreements and trade secret agreements. So with that said, um, now with, with some notable exceptions, including California. So California, you can have a confidentiality agreement, um, but not a non-solicitation agreement, not a non-solicitation of customers, not an anti-piracy agreement. I'm not a California lawyer. Uh, that is how I understand that law to be written. So, Focusing in on Arizona law, when is a non-competition agreement enforceable under Arizona law? Number one, it has to be ancillary to another enforceable agreement. And that generally means an employment agreement. And it doesn't need to be a long written, drawn out employment agreement. Arizona law says uh, by its very definition that employment between an employer and employee is a contractual relationship, an at-will employment relationship. So this is not a hard um, element to meet for employer employees in Arizona. I do see them sometimes in connection with an independent contractor agreement. And I get this question from time to time. 
can I have a non-compete agreement with my independent contractor? The answer to that, like any good lawyer, it's always it depends. Um, but that said, a lot of times I will advise a client that comes to me um, in that situation to think through what that independent contractor relationship means. Because by definition, if you've got an independent contractor, then that person has other business. So can you really legally, should you really legally undermine that person's ability to serve customers similar to your business? And if you should, and it's appropriate, one, I would, suggest that you take a look at whether that's a true independent contractor uh, principal relationship or whether it should be an employee employer relationship. Um, but two, it would might be a rarer situation in which it would be appropriate to have that kind of um, non-compete in an independent contractor relationship. Number two, Non-compete non agreements must be narrowly tailored to protect the employer's legitimate business interests. And what are those legitimate business interests? Typically, we see two things being cited as the employer's interest. One would be protection of trade secrets, confidential information, proprietary information. Two is goodwill, um, customer goodwill. So those two things are generally what the legitimate interests are. You could have others, but that's what I usually see in the case law. And then the third thing is that they need to be reasonable in scope. Reasonable in scope. Well, that sounds very vague. What does that mean? So there are three aspects of reasonableness. One, they need to be reasonableness in time. So what does that mean? Um, in an ordinary employment relationship, there are cases in Arizona that say the time should be the amount of time it takes for the employer to find a replacement employee and train that person and establish sometimes if it's a customer facing relationship and establish the relationships with customers. So, for the most part, five years is probably too long. I used to think that about two years was probably okay. I no longer think that. I think it's much narrower than than a year, uh, than two years, closer to one year. And there is a case out there that had a six month that was upheld, and there are cases out there that have a lot of two years, and those are not upheld. The, um, the Arizona case I'll talk about in a minute, that's kind of the seminal case on the subject, um, involved doctors. So those have some special considerations, but that was a three-year agreement. It was found to be overbroad. The geographic scope, what does that mean? That means where, um, you know, the geographic reach in what territory. Um, I have seen nationwide geographic scope be upheld. That might be rarer. Um, more commonly, I see in agreements countywide, statewide, sometimes multi-state um, provisions. But again, they need to be narrowly tailored at the same time as being reasonable. So you want to think about what is the territory that the employee is actually covering for the employer? Where does the employer actually do business? Um, and I guess I would say there's employee-employer um, aspects of this, and there's also non-competes incident to the sale of a business. When you are selling a business, you can have a broader scope um, on time and geographic scope than you might be able to have in connection with an ordinary employer-employee um, relationship. And then the last aspect is the substantive scope of protection for the employer. So what does that mean? It's the industry. It's what is prohibited. Um, I see agreements written a fair amount where the employer comes in and writes the agreement and says, employee, you can't compete for a period of one year 
in Arizona, meaning you can't work for any company in the same industry as our company. And that sounds okay on the surface, but I have seen judges say to companies or companies' lawyers in those situations, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by a company in your industry? You should know what your industry is. And so I make a point when I'm talking to clients about this to define what is your industry? What do you do? What is this employee doing? And if you do multiple things, for example, um, if you're in the um, publishing business and you both sell books and let's say, um, oh, this is a terrible example because I can't, <laughs> I can't come up with the other part of it, but let's say you're in the publishing business and you sell books um, as well as um, have a library and the employee is only in the book sales aspect of things, you can't prohibit them from working for another library. Um, so if you have, you know, um, a, a, a car business and also something that isn't related to cars, you know, again, like um, a manufacturing aspect you're selling cars in one in one aspect of your business and another aspect of your business you are a tire manufacturer um you can't prohibit an employee working in the tire manufacturing business from selling cars so um to that end these agreements should be again narrowly tailored and have some definition in substantive scope in order to be enforceable as noted, restriction has to relate to activities and the job functions the employee performed. Um, and again, the legitimate interest should be confidential information, trade secrets, and the goodwill of the business. Um, I would also say that when you're looking at these agreements and you want um, to impose a confidentiality clause, um, you're going to want to look at what are your practices? Is this information truly confidential? One of the more difficult things that I think employers come across in these situations and they go to enforce their agreements is did they really maintain the information as confidential and is it truly confidential? So when you have, for example, customer information that is well known in the industry that um, you've got, um, you know, a paper mill, for example, is a consumer of, lum of lumber. We know that. They need lumber in order to uh, make paper. And so who the, um, who the paper mills are in the lumber business is going to be probably pretty well established um, and generally known to the public. So that's not going to be confidential information. However, things like how much lumber did that particular paper mill buy in any particular time period? Who is the buyer at that organization? What is the internal structure that gets lumber purchases um, approved? Those kinds of information, that's going to be more confidential. However, you're going to wanna make sure that you've taken those steps to maintain that information as confidential. It shouldn't be something that just everybody knows in the business. And especially if you're trying to protect true trade secrets. Classic trade secret, Coke formula. Um, no one knows the formula of Coke. Um, every, every once in a while you see an internet post, yes, it's out there, um, we know the formula of Coke, but, but no, no one really knows. It's a classic trade secret, it's not a patent. Um, Classic, kept under wraps, no one knows it. So, and, and while you don't have to necessarily take the extreme precautions that Coca-Cola probably takes to maintain that Coca-Cola formula, you do have to take precautions, lock down your system, limit the number of people who are truly exposed to what your, what your real trade secrets are. And you can have confidential information that isn't a trade secret, but just note that there's some very specific uh, 
things that you need to do as a business in order to protect information as a trade secret. Um, all right, I already talked about these. Uh, Valley Medical Specialists versus Farber is the case that I mentioned, the leading case in Arizona on this subject. Um, the covenant not to compete in that case was a three-year covenant, said five miles from any office that the uh, employer had was in the medical professions. There were some public policy considerations, but this is the case that established that narrowly tailored to protect the legitimate business interests of the employer and um, required the reasonableness. The court held the three years was not reasonable. And they said five miles from any office, well, that encompassed a, a, um, a geographic territory of 235 square miles. Note that there's a number of cases out there um, that I've seen even with um, within Maricopa County. Maricopa County is over 9,000 square miles. So you might, it sounds like one county, not that far, not that much reach, but there are cases out there that talk about the square miles involved in, um, in Maricopa County. So um, you want to be very careful on these geographic scopes when you're looking at entering into agreements and then also later enforcing them. Um, an enforceable agreement was found uh, in Bedmark versus Kelly. And that case was uh, a prohibition on working for any mattress store within 10 miles of any Bedmark store. So probably a larger territory than what was faced in Farber, but no, it was six months. It was a six month restriction. Um, one of the things that the court in Farber talked about, and when you look at um, non-competes non and non-solicitation provisions, whether you're dealing with non-solicitation of customers or non-solicitation of employees in Arizona, Farber is the case that you look at. Um, and so one of the things that came up in that case and has come up repeatedly is, and in some states you can do this, in Arizona you can't. Can you... Uh, have the judge change the agreement. If the agreement says three years and five miles from any location where the company had a business location, can the judge say, well, three years isn't reasonable, but one would be, and I'm just going to change it. Um, and in some jurisdictions, yes, they can do that. In Arizona, you can't do that. So what um, the the court says we have a strict, what's called a blue pencil rule. It's really a red pencil rule. But if you can line out what the agreement says and cross it out, and it still makes grammatical sense, then the court would enforce that. So for a while, we had this trend, and you might see some agreements still that have what are called step-down provisions. And they say things like, well, you can't work for any mattress store within... 10 miles of a Bedmart store for a period of 24 months. But if the court finds 24 months too long, then it's a period of 18 months. And if the court finds 18 months too long, then it's a period of 12 months. Um, and you could line out some of that text that says if a court finds 18 months too long, then you line out the 24 and the 18 and you come up with 12. Some lawyers like those, others um, others find them to be um, a little burdensome. Um, and my own opinion is I tend to gravitate towards helping people figure out what's reasonable and, and choosing a time period and geographic scope that they can live with. It might not be as broad as what they would ideally like, but what can they live with that is supportable by the facts and the circumstances of this employee's employment. So looking at the non-solicitation of customers provisions, again, it's the same test. They have to be reasonable. You need to uh, identify in the agreement, which customers are we talking about? What activity is prohibited and for how long? Um, sometimes, you will have a non-solicitation provision that says you cannot indirectly or directly um, solicit the business from any customer of the employer that the employee worked with in the one year period prior to the employee leaving. 
Um, and I think that's probably pretty close to enforceable. Um, hard to predict in this area as well, because um, it's very fact specific. Who's the employee? What were they doing? And it's also judges have different approaches to these agreements. I sometimes say that I could walk down to Superior Court with the same agreement, walk into two judges chambers um, and get three answers as to whether the agreement would be enforceable. So um, it's very judge specific. It, it depends very much on the facts and circumstances of what you're trying to enforce. Um, a couple of things that I see that um, courts have said make agreements overbroad are attempts to prohibit solicitation of non-customers, so pr prospective customers, where the employee wasn't even working on leads, um, where generally customers of the employer, where there's multiple salespeople. So, if, you know, you've got five people selling a product and um, you can't prohibit or try to prohibit Susie from soliciting Joe's customers because Susie, unless you can prove that Susie knew of and had relationships there, you can protect the customer relationship. You can't protect against competition generally. Um, in a non-solicitation uh, context. Again, with non-solicitation of employees, it must be reasonable. Um, which of your employees are you talking about? So you, you probably you have to look at what is the employer's protectable interest. The protectable interest in a non-solicitation agreement with with employees of the employers a little different than the customer relationships in a non-solicitation situation and goodwill of the business or confidentiality um, in both a customer relationship and, uh, sorry, in a non-solicitation context and a non-compete context. Um, both of those kinds of agreements have goodwill and confidentiality as, um, as the, um, protectable interest of the employer. When you're talking about a non-solicitation of employees, it's also goodwill, but it's a different kind of goodwill. It's the investment that the employer makes in training the employee and providing, again, confidential information. Um, similar concepts, but when you go to enforce these, you want to look at what the employee had as far as those items. So the fact that you have confidential information, but you don't share that with all the employees or um, you don't do anything to train your employees might make it more difficult to enforce a non-solicitation of employee provision. Um, slightly different kind of interest. And then, you know, what is prohibited? Um, non-solicitation clauses can be both non-solicitation, so I can't seek, I can't even ask them to come work for me, and they can also be non-hire clauses. And again, when you look at these in the non-hire context versus the non-solicitation clauses, you get, you run up against some antitrust concepts where um, they can, you can have a little more scrutiny um, of them. And when you're talking about agreements not between employer and employee, or incident to the sale of a business, but between um, a customer and, and a company, for example, the considerations are a little bit different, especially when you're talking about the non-solicitation piece, when it's non-solicitation of employees. And again, can't say it enough in this area, it's tricky. There's a lot of nuance. You should be seeking um, legal advice in, 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 in every instance, in my opinion. And I know I'm a lawyer. But um, I think it's very important to get your own legal advice here. So um, this is an interesting case. Uh, BMO Harris versus Corley, case from federal court a couple of years ago. And again, this is the wonky lawyer part of the presentation. Um, the agreement said that the employee could not solicit for employment or offer employment to any person or persons who were employed by BMO for 12 months following the termination of employment. 
also could not solicit, contact, accept business with, or enter into a commercial arrangement with any customer or supplier for any, per per with, for any purpose which competes with the business for 12 months following termination. Could not take advantage or derive a benefit, otherwise profit from any business opportunities the employee learned about during the course of employment or directly or indirectly use, disclose, or otherwise distribute any confidential information and the provision is applicable in areas where BMO does business, including aerospace. Wow. So I'm going to break this down a little bit and walk through um, some thoughts that I have and 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 on this position, on this uh, provision. It says the employee may not solicit for employment or offer employment to any persons who are employed by BMO for 12 months following the termination of employment. So is this a non-compete? No, it's not a non-compete. It's a non-solicitation of employees, an anti-piracy cause, no poach clause. Sometimes they're called no poach clause. Is it enforceable? Um, I'm going to say it depends on this one. Good lawyer answer. Um, because the first part of it, solicit for employment or offer employment to any person or persons who are employed by BMO, and for 12 months following termination of employment, that would probably be okay, but for the question of, it's very broad in that it doesn't talk about whether the employee who's subject to the agreement knew of the employment and was acquainted with the individuals um, as a result of their employment. So especially when you're dealing with a larger organization like BMO Harris, you may want to think through which employees are involved in the non-solicitation of employment uh, provision. It also says, did I miss one? Ah, solicit, contact, accept business with, or enter into a commercial reason, arrangement with any customer or supplier for any purpose that competes with the business for 12 months following the termination of employment. Is this one a non-compete? It uses the, per, the word compete. Um, my answer to that is maybe. Um, could call it a non-solicitation, um, but it does limit the employee's ability to compete it doesn't say you can't become employed. So under the FTC definition, it is probably not a non-compete, but then that relates to, is it enforceable, the final question. Um, and this again, it depends. How are we defining customer or supplier and how are we defining business? They're capitalized, so they were probably defined elsewhere in the agreement. Um, in this situation, you're going to want to look into whether customers or suppliers are those that the employee had contact with, that had the employee had relationships with during the employment with the employer. Employee may not take advantage of or derive a benefit or otherwise profit from any business opportunities the employee learned about during the course of employment. Is this a non-compete? What do we think? I probably should have had a voting button on this one. Um, this is probably a no, it's not a non-compete, um, but is it enforceable? Uh, it's potentially enforceable. I, I'm not sure what it means. So it's, it's got a lot of vague terms. I'm not sure. I guess I'm gonna change my answer there. It's probably not enforceable. It's got a lot of vague terms. I'm not sure what the employer's protected interest is in here. Um, you know, obviously during the course of your employment, employees have fiduciary obligations of loyalty to an employer. So if they learn about a business opportunity that's appropriate for the, uh, the business, it would be, inappropriate and probably a breach of the employee's fiduciary duty if they went into that business or took advantage of that um, business. Um, I 
to the detriment of the employer, if it's something the employer might want to go into. Um, so this kind of extends that post-employment. And the final provision in the BMO Harris case was uh, the employee may not directly or indirectly use, disclose, or otherwise distribute any confidential information of the employer. Um, and is this a non-compete? Probably not. This is confidentiality clause. And is it enforceable? It probably is. Um, it depends on the definition of confidential information. Sometimes um, there are legal protections that limit what can be confidential information, um, but probably beyond the scope of what we can talk about today to, uh, to address what those are. So I'm gonna leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, I hope this helped you all understand a little bit more about what's going on with federal law and what may or may not be enforceable under state law. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll hang around for a bit. Um, I think we will be sending out the slides and feel free to contact me um, anytime with an email if you do have questions about um, what we talked about today awesome. or any other issues in employment law. Feel free to shoot me an email. So thank you so much, Helen. And actually, I did have a question for you. Um, and it has to do with the ubiquitous employee handbook. Right. So we see, especially with small businesses, they get or they purchase or they wherever it comes from. Right. They have the employee handbook. They have the employee when they are signed on, say, I agree to the terms of the employee handbook. The only consideration is employment. Uh, what do you do with those? Well, that employee handbook almost certainly also says it is not a contract. Um, I hope it says it's not a contract because if it is a contract, then you, you're contractually bound to all the provisions in it. So I hope you have your legal counsel review those. Um, and, um, and that they have disclaimers in them that say this is not a contract, but you nonetheless agree to comply with the employer's policies, practices, and procedures. And so I think there's two aspects of this. When it, as it relates to non-competes and confidentiality provisions, the handbook is not a contract. And so if you wanna go into court and enforce a confidentiality or non-competition agreement, especially a non-compete agreement, that's contained within your employee handbook, but the employee has not separately entered into a separate agreement, I think you're going to have a lot of problems with that. Because, as I said earlier, that handbook almost hurt, certainly, and I hope, says this is not a contract. So if you do want to enforce those agreements in court, you do want to enter into a standalone separate agreement. That said, is it a bad idea to have a policy on confidentiality or other policies that are written in your handbook and what can you do with that handbook? Absolutely not. And I, you know, once an employee employer reaches a certain um, critical mass, I'm an advocate of having employee handbooks. You need them to provide for things like time off, our Arizona paid sick leave law. There are lots of ins and outs to that. You should have policies about what's prohibited in the workplace to give people notice and give them an understanding of who you are what you expect from them. Um, you should have non-discrimination policies. You should have a harassment reporting. I mean, I could go on and on. It's a whole other subject. Um, but whereas it relates to the topic today in terms of non-competes, confidentiality agreements, sure, throw a confidentiality policy in there, but understand that if you want to enforce that in court, you're going to have a harder time um, enforcing those provisions. I, I, I will, I'll say that I have seen circumstances where employers have been successful, but it's rare. So if you want to have a much better shot of enforceability as to something relating to confidentiality and particularly those trade secrets, enter into specific agreements. And, and talk to counsel who's experienced in the area about 
uh, whether that's me or somebody else, I'm not, I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just saying talk to a lawyer about it because there are, as you can see from, from the information in this webinar, a lot of ins and outs to this area. And it's constantly changing. And relative to this particular rule, it's probably going to be changing a lot between now and September 4th. So, Helen, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate you hopping in and, you know, addressing this very timely issue. And um, I look forward to seeing a lot of you next week when AZ Bio Peers comes back on its regular schedule where we're going to be talking about talent. So until then, thank you, everybody. Have a great week. And again, Helen, thank you for a great presentation. Bye-bye, everybody. Jim. All right. Take care.